It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Christian and Tomas from Nanoform, a company headquartered in Finland. Um, they are experts in uh, formulation and are here to teach us a little bit about uh, this uh, this uh, hidden art uh, for us medicinal chemists. Uh, Tomas holds a PhD degree in chemical engineering from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Uh, he works at Nanoform as a lead scientist, and in his previous role, he was head of preclinical development at Tavanta um, and has 15 years of experience in the formulation, in vitro, and in vitro evaluation of mainly poorly soluble compounds. Uh, Christian is the chief commercial officer at Nanoform. Uh, previously, he was a commercial director at Johnson Matthey in the Innovator Pharma Products and Solutions Group. Uh, before that, he was a member of the senior leadership team at Dr. Reddy's, and uh, his first commercial role was at Personics, a company that was developing a proprietary particle engineering technology that was sold to Circasha for 100 million pounds. Uh, so Christian, I saw on the news recently, uh, you guys signed a new partnership with AstraZeneca. I'd love to hear more about uh, uh, about that. Uh, sure. Um, so uh, we're we're very fortunate to work with um, ten of the top twenty pharma companies um, in 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 the world. Um, AZ um, are our longest standing uh, partners, and um, you know they've evaluated our our CES nanoforming technology um, uh, for a variety of compounds. And as that uh, relationship has uh, has developed and uh, grown over time. Um, and as Nanoform are bringing in digital elements to uh, to our business to do things more smartly, very very nicely aligned with some of their ambitions to be um, to be smart about drug development. So um, this is um, access global access to our Star Map uh, platform that gives um, our partners the ability to screen as many molecules as they like. Um, to see whether they're suitable for our technology for nanoforming and then to contact nanoform when there's a good fit um, to um, to take that product forward so um, yeah we're very pleased um, uh, about that news that came out and and, and I'm sure that's going to be a, a great path forward uh, as, as we work together. Great well congratulations um, and yeah you, you were also telling me earlier about a blockbuster that uh, you all had worked on um, can you tell us some more details about that project? Yeah, absolutely. Um, working on, uh, I think, is the uh, right tense. Um, so uh, exciting project where uh, we've been able to demonstrate that our technology by making nanoparticles um, in a tablet based formulation, um, that we can actually reduce several tablets to a single tablet. Um, and um, uh, this also uh, negates the need uh, for an amorphous solid dispersion, um, which is the current uh, marketed product. Um, uh, creates a novel opportunity for life cycle extension um, with uh, the originator uh, company or indeed value added medicine uh, companies. So uh, yeah, very exciting uh, to be working on that project as well. Cool. Yeah, it seems like a nice way to get best in class products with the same molecule. Um, you know, one of the interesting things to think about is, you know, you mentioned as a formulation partner to companies, you see a huge range of problems from clients all over the industry. Uh, what are the most surprising uh, and interesting projects you've ever seen? Damash? Well, the most interesting request or project proposal that we've ever got was micro robots loaded micro with robots? a particle. Yes, micro robots loaded <laughs> with a particle payload. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's that. That, that was certainly a, a unique, um, a unique uh, uh, inquiry. Um, I mean, one that's one that's actually moved forward um, is a project with a company in Portugal called Targtex, uh, and I guess uh, perhaps not the most um, interesting, but the most exciting project I think that one of the ones that we're working on, and this is for glioblastoma, um, and we've actually helped them to develop a, a hydrogel-based formulation for implantation into the brain. Uh, post tumor resection of a of glioblastoma, um, and with our technology, we were able to increase the drug load in the hydrogel by two hundred fold over that of the uh, the bulk drug substance, and that's now enabled in an animal study in rats, um, a forty percent um, of the rats that survived long term, um, where with every other formulation that was tried, by whether it be nano milling or solution excipient based approaches, all of the rats died. So we're moving actually into into clinical study program with them. So, and they recently, I think just a, a month or two ago, uh, received orphan drug designation from the FDA um, for malignant gliomas, 
uh, for, for this formulation approach uh, that we've worked on with them. So that's super exciting. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, cool. So yeah, last question before we get started. Um, you know, in your opinion, why do you think med chemists should start thinking about formulation earlier? Do you want to go, Tamash? Um, sure. So very briefly, we do have several tricks up in our sleeves, but what you do do determine the fate of the project in several cases. I th I think also um uh, we don't have time on our sides um, and uh, and actually when I start to think about um, a number of the programs that we're working on um, they are time critical right so our partners particularly in certain areas certain disease areas like oncology or uh, maybe rare or orphan diseases getting a product to market is so important and uh, and getting it there as fast as possible is really really important so the earlier you can start to think about formulation options the better um, and, you know, in a, I think in a classical system, you might see that, well, first of all, you need to look at bioavailability in preclinical uh, development to make sure that the molecule is successful in phase one. And then after phase one, you can start to think about, you know, uh, improving the formulation, optimizing the formulation, et cetera, um, and going forward. But actually, with some of our clients, Time is so sensitive that if you can um, both improve the bioavailability and optimize the formulation before you move into phase one, that's a smarter thing to do because actually you might not have the time available to actually to, to do that further de formulation development work post phase one. Because if you've got good data, there's a real pressure within a lot of businesses and, and organizations to move that molecule forward quickly. Um, and then I think the other uh, thing to say is you spend so much time, again, uh, time related on the chemistry. So much time is invested on the chemistry. It's so crucial that if you if you have great molecules, that you get the maximum value out of them. And that can only be realized sometimes with smart formulations. Um, so, you know, being a chemist myself, I remember the adage that, uh, you know, the chemist makes the molecule and then, well, we've done our job and we chuck it over the wall to the formulator. Um, but the reality is... Um, uh, if you can be smart about what you pass on to your colleagues and, and provide them with options that you've already considered, it's much more likely that that molecule may, may proceed um, in the right path. All right. Thank you, Christian. All right. Great. Uh, well, with that, we can uh, dive more into formulations. So um, I can start with some slides just to introduce the topic for our audience, and then we'll pass it over to um, you and Tamash. Uh, so today, uh, as mentioned, we're going to be presenting a medicinal chemist guide to formulation options to improve bioavailability, high level overview. Um, I'll start with just quickly, you know, again, a recap of why formulations matter, some recent events uh, that make this even more compelling. Then I'll pass it over to Tomasz, who will tell us the technical details of, you know, what are the formulation options, uh, how to select one, and some case studies. All right. So as uh, Christian mentioned, I, you know, I, I certainly am guilty of this view uh, when I started. Um, you know, often in MedChem, we think we just our job is just to find the molecule, you know, find the chemical structure. And then after that, we punt it over to process chem. And then, you know, somehow somewhere in the building, uh, formulators take it over and turn it into a pill. Um, uh, so very much a, a throw it over the fence mentality. But increasingly, you know, with certainly with smaller companies, with different types of indications that we're going into, um, I think it's important to remember that, uh, as you have said, you know, formulation is really the process by which the molecule becomes the product or becomes the medicine. Uh, we often think of this as, you know, sort of black magic or or uh, what have you. Um, but uh, really, the molecule is not a drug product until it has been formulated, and that carries a lot of properties with it. Uh, you know, big big molecules in the news recently: uh, Merck's molecule MK zero six one six. Uh, first in class oral PCSK9 inhibitor, absolutely amazing. Uh, this was presented at ACS last uh, earlier this year and just stunning, right? Because this molecule, you look at this thing, 1,550 molecular weight peptidic structure, yet it has an or it has oral efficacy in phase two at 20 mg once daily using a formulation. Um, they've said that there is basically little or no bioavailability with standard formulations. So uh, I think a very dramatic illustration of that point. Um, just to list out some of the properties, right? I mean, you know, we tend to assume, okay, once you've got the chemical structure, you know, that molecule should be identical in all ways. 
But um, just depending on how the molecule is formulated, many properties can be influenced. Solubility, bioavailability, even uh, how quickly it gets into the bloodstream, the Tmax, and so you can have fast acting formulations. Uh, the PK, the oral PK of the molecule, the Cmax, Ctroph, the apparent half-life, you can have extended release tablets, right? Very important properties. Where the molecule gets absorbed, um, if it's absorbed on the tongue or in the stomach or in the small intestine, large intestine, um, you know, there are drugs with enteric coatings to bypass the stomach if, you know, you have uh, a molecule that's shredded by gastric peptidases. And finally, you know, as Christian mentioned, drug dose, pill size, uh, having a once daily versus twice daily formulation, uh, these can all, uh, all of these properties combined, all of which are heavily influenced by formulation, can directly impact efficacy, tolerability, convenience, um, and make the difference between a best in class product versus a drug that doesn't advance. Um, there's more news. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I think that again, Hammer This Home is great timing for this talk. Uh, Pfizer had a molecule, Danagliperon. It was a front runner for uh, GLP-1R agonists, a massive, a massive potential market. It was competing with Lilly and uh, Chew Guys before Glipron, which is a once daily drug. Uh, they unfortunately uh, ran into unexpectedly high rates of side effects in a phase two trial. And also they have a twice daily formulation of this, uh, what was originally a backup compound. And so they had to halt the study of this twice daily formulation to go back to studying a once daily formulation in phase one in order to be competitive with orforglipron. Uh, that's a great example of how, um, you know, we tend to assume that we can bring in these uh, different formulations later on, but, um, uh, you know, sometimes in a competitive environment, you just don't have time for that. So as far as uh, listing out all the factors beyond the structure itself that can impact properties, you know, you have pre-formulation and drug substance properties. What is the salt form of the drug? Are there co-formers in, uh, in the solid product that influence properties? Um, what type of solid is the compound? Is it in a crystalline versus amorphous form? Is it a different type of polymorph? All of these can have dis different dissolution properties. And as we'll hear in a bit, uh, the formulation itself, uh, what is the particle size of these? Uh, of this compound? Uh, what excipients do you have in there? Fillers, disintegrants, polymers? Uh, what kind of matrix is it embedded in? Is it a hydrogel, controlled release polymer, so on? And uh, what dosage form is it? Tablets or a film? All of these factor into uh, the ultimate product properties of the product. So hopefully uh, this is uh, convincing to show why drug hunters need to stay involved th throughout the process. Um, you know, these should not be thought of as uh, entirely different activities, um, you know, what the the pill, what is ultimately the drug product uh, should very much be influenced by the medicinal chemists working on it. Um, and increasingly in the new environment, we, as Christian has mentioned, we simply don't get multiple shots on goal. So for example, in oncology, you often can't study uh, new products and healthy volunteers. And so, you know, what you go into in the clinic will likely be the formulation that ultimately you know, gets gets taken through to approval uh, optimistically. In rare diseases, there often simply just are not enough patients to try more than one formulation. And so you have to get it right the first time. And finally, as we mentioned with competition, you know, there's so much more competition nowadays for the big indications. And it's not necessarily the best in class molecules that win, but it's the best in class drug products that win. And we'll see some examples of that shortly. Uh, just a quick uh, principle that I think is helpful to understand going into Tamasha's portion of the talk. Um, why uh, why do things like formulation or particle size seem to matter so much? Uh, we've done an article on this in the past called uh, the square cube law. Uh, and fundamentally, uh, one of the reasons why you see such dramatic differences is that um, properties like dissolution, which are proportional to dissolution rate, which is proportional to particle surface area, um, that scales differently from properties like particle size or volume, which uh, scales in a cubic matter. And so what happens is uh, when you look at the size of things, uh, if you're looking at a very small scale, uh, obviously surface area uh, scales more, uh, more slowly than volume. And so the smaller and smaller you get, the exponential, uh, your, your volume to surface area ratio uh, grows exponentially. Uh, this fundamental property is the reason why different types of stars exist, right? You have neutron stars, black holes, et cetera. It's that surface area to volume ratio. But this is also one of the reasons that for chemists, you know, the classic rookie mistake in the lab is you try to scale a reaction from 100 megs to 10 grams and it doesn't work. 
Um, well, heat transfer, you know, stirring, all, all sorts of properties are proportional to surface area, but of course, uh, flask volume um, scales, uh, scales in a different way. Uh, with that nanoform, uh, you know, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is you shared this uh, with me. You had a molecule in phase one, peroxicam, where uh, in vitro on the right, it looks like the nanoform material does dissolve, I mean, dramatically faster or more efficiently than any of the other formulations that you've tried. Uh, I, I thought it was cool that in phase one, you did actually see that this reduced the T max of the molecule for an immediate release formulation. Um, so very exciting human proof of concept of how uh, this can this can work in a really impressive way. So with that, Mosh, I'll let you take over. All right, I can see your slides in the PowerPoint view. Uh, are you able to share the slides? Can you see the slides now? Uh, I can see the slides, but it's still, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So thank you, guys. That was a stellar warm up session. <laughs> so we're going to um, start with two case studies. One is going to be the Merck compound that you mentioned, and the other one is phenofibrate. And then, then we're going to discuss on a very high level the drugability enabling technologies out there. This is not going to be an exhaustive list or description. We do not have the time to do that. Then we're going to talk about the biophotosynthetic classification system and formulation selection based on BCS. Um, if there are some veteran formulators here, then Probably it's not going to be too interesting for them, but I'll try to add some fun facts to the slides um, for them. Um, then we're, we're going to overview Nanoform's platform technologies, and we'll end the presentation with two case studies. The first one is a nanocrystal formulation matching the performance of a solid dispersion, and the second one is an injectable, long-acting injectable formulation based on nanocrystals. And uh, we're going to summarize what we talked about, and my reading list is going to be provided so you can do your homework. So uh, this is the Merck compound, MK0616, that Dennis introduced. Looking at it from the formulation perspe perspective and physical chemical perspective, um, this compound is isolated as a chloride salt. And crystalline forms were elusive, only the amorphous form is available. The compound is soluble, decently soluble in fasted state intestinal fluid and exhibits extremely low KCO2 permeability. So this is a prototypical example of a permeability limited compound, which is gonna fall into BCS3. We're gonna talk about that later. The, uh, it has a very interesting formulation. This compound, actually 20 mix of it, is co-formulated with 360 mix of the permeation enhancer sodium caprate. Sodium caprate is an approved food additive and we take it basically every day. It is a component in low millimolar concentrations in milk and other nutrient sources as well. And the permeation enhancer improved CMAX and exposure by fivefold and twofold, respectively. So, uh, enabled about two percent bioavailability. Um, sodium caprate has been investigated, and it's been around for for thirty plus years, and still the exact mechanism of action of how it improves permeability remains to be elucidated. It might perturb the epithelial cell membranes, or it can open tight junctions to improve the paracellular transport. It might even form hydrophobic complexes, or we can call, call them insoluble salts with the API to enable absorption, or it might change the viscoelastic properties of the gut mucosa but overall, we have no idea. We have very some strong hypotheses, but uh, we cannot pinpoint a single mechanism of how it works. And this Merck compound is similar to, to 
semaglutide, for example, in formulations that is also co-formulated with permeation enhancers. So uh, that's one prototypical permeability limited compound that we have. And the second example is phonofibrate. This is a totally different word. Phonofibrate is an oral medication to treat high lipid levels. And this is one of the most prescribed medications in the US. Um, the structures on the right hand side, it, a free form is used in various drug products. The API is crystalline, has extremely low water solubility, and several formulations are marketed. And this is a um, example our formulation has a profound effect on PK and thus the dose, the food interaction, and food restriction. So it was launched. I think in the 70s, a non-micronized capsule was first marketed. Then in the 90s, a micronized formulation became available, either as uh, the API uh, micronized in, in a tablet or an inert core coated with, with uh, microparticles of phenofibrate. And ultimately, a nanoparticle formulation and a lipid-based formulation were launched in the early 2000s. You can see in the middle upper chart that this compound started as a 300 mg dose medication and through very various uh, formulation improvements, we ended up with 145 milligram dose for the nanoparticle formulation. And maybe even more importantly, all of the marketed drug products are to be taken with a meal as that improves the absorption. So the bioavailability is higher in in the fat state, while the nanoparticle formulation enabled dosing regardless of prandial state. And most probably, it improved the dissolution rate of the compound in the fasted state intestinal fluid, which then, which in turn enables a high extent of absorption in the fasted state. So to sum up, this is a prototypical example of a poorly soluble compound where nanoparticles enable dose reduction from 300 mg to 145 mg and administration regardless of prandial state. So we talked about nanoparticles and permeation enhancers. Um, and I'd like to introduce a couple of variability enabling technologies on this slide. And uh, as I highlighted, this categorization is somewhat arbitrary and um, some technologies might overlap. Um, I came up with these four categories. So the first is the crystal form modification. One example here is a salt formation if the compound has ionizable groups. This is usually one of the very first steps to perform a salt screening to improve solubility in case of poorly soluble compounds or to improve physical and slash or chemical stability in the solid state. I believe like the very, fir very first uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor is marketed as the mesylate salt. So that's one prime example. Then, um, Usually, the thermodynamically stable polymorph is the least soluble one. And it is possible to use higher energy polymorphs over the amorphous form if the stability of those allow it in a drug product to, to improve the dissolution rate and the apparent solubility. So, fear Lucas in Accolade is used as an amorphous API. Then the third option here, formulation option here, um, and sorry, some, some people do not consider these as formulation options, more like crystal engineering options, but uh, please allow this terminology here uh, to call co-crystals as formulation options. Um, co-crystals are two component systems without uh, the exchange of that proton. And Tresto might be one example it's a co-crystal of sacrobitril and valsartan. Actually, it's a bit more complicated. It's a complex sodium salt slash co-crystal system of sacrobitril and valsartan. The second large group is the size reduction group. 
for only soluble compounds besides salt formation, micronization is usually the default step. Abiotaryl acetate is micronized inside the formulation. We talked about phenofibrate and what nanoparticles enabled. Phenofibrate in three core is nanomilled. That's usually done in whole meals um, to reduce the particle size below what can be achieved by micronization. And I would like to mention here nanoforming that is based on the SAS technology. We're going to dive, dive deeper in the later section of this presentation here. And nanoforming is a gentle way to prepare nanoparticles, neat nanoparticles of APIs. The third group is the amorphous solid dispersions group. Um, spray drying is one option to produce solid dispersions. Um, the API is co-dissolved with some kind of polymer and uh, is atomized in a nozzle and a warm um, drying gas dries the droplets and in a cyclone, the, the solid dispersion is separated. Extendi in, uh, is formulated in the tablet forms. Azolutamide is formulated as a uh, spray dry dispersion in Xtendi. Second option, a popular option to prepare hot matter, uh, sorry, amorphous solid dispersions is hot matter extrusion. The API is loaded into a heated barrel together with a polymer. At least the polymer melts in there and dissolves the API and then the resulting mixture is rapidly cooled and in an ideal case, a solid solution is produced or alternatively some amorphous drug-rich domains appear in the polymer matrix. In oxafil, osaconazole is in the form of a amorphous solid dispersion which is matte extruded. And there are some miscellaneous other technologies out there to produce solid dispersions as well, like cold precipitation, Zalboref, the MRFNIB API is one example there. And the last group is the solubilized system, solubilized systems. Um, of course, we, we could come up with many, many subcategories here. I group these to two, which are the liquid-based formulations. Um, this can include self-emulsifying drug delivery systems, nano-emulsions, microemulsions, and so on. Ephagrans is formulated in Sastiva in Sastiva as a lipid-based formulation. And um, solubilization can be done with cyclodextrins as well. Cyclodextrins are cyclic, cyclic sugars with a hydrophobic bucket that, um, that can complex certain sized and so, uh, certain um, APIs, mainly poorly soluble APIs to have a drug cyclodextrin complex. Um, so um, there are some overlapping um, categories here. For example, with nanoforming, we can reduce the size while producing amorphous particles. Um, so these are not uh, rock solid boundaries between these categories. And of course, there are some other emerging, emerging technologies out there which were not mentioned here. Okay, so we arrived at the biopharmaceutical classification system. It was introduced in 95 by Amidon and, and colleagues, and it separates the orally administered drugs into four domains based on their solubility and permeability. A drug substance is highly soluble if the highest dose dissolves in 250 ml of aqueous media in the bioreligant pH range. And a drug substance is considered to be highly permeable if the extent of absorption is 90 plus percent. These are the base definitions, but sometimes uh, permeability is, is uh, determined by ACO2 assays, and based on that, it is categorized into poorly permeable or highly permeable ones. And um, as you can see on the right hand side, in 2000, 2006, out of the top 200 drugs, roughly one third was in class one, class two, and class three. 
with my first and being in class four, so low solubility and low permeability. And there's a shift towards having 80 or up to 90% poorly soluble compounds by 2019, for example, in the novel physical. And actually, Christian and our colleague uh, Jamie wrote a, an excellent article about this shift towards high low fee compounds to drug counter. So please check it out. And a fun fact for the veteran formulators who might get bored, the Amidon et al. paper from 95 is the most cited paper in pharmaceutical sciences. So let's go to BCS1 compounds. So these are the highly soluble and highly permeable ones. This is the easiest case. Usually a conventional tablet or capsule formulation is sufficient to enable ideal PK. Um, there might be some pitfalls we have to pay attention to, incompatibilities between the API and the excipient. For example, GI tract instability that Dennis mentioned earlier. So some examples are shown below, aspirin, ondansetron, imatinib, and propranol, or caffeine in our daily coffee, or twice daily, or several times daily coffee is a BCS1 compound. As we talk, talked about that in um, maybe 10, 20 years back, um, one third or even more compounds in, out of the top 200 drugs belong to BCS1, and there's a clear shift. So poor formulators uh, will have more and more grid dust compounds and poor compounds in the future. Uh, we arrived with it to BCS2. These are the poorly soluble compounds with decent permeability. Um, salt formation or salt screening and micronization are the default steps. And in case those are insufficient, then formulators might develop an amorphous solid dispersion or nanoparticle-based formulations. And it is important to mention that the BCS classification for certain compounds is heavily formulation dependent. So um, poorly soluble drugs in, in their bulk state can be turned into BCS1-like formulation. Um, and selection of, of the drug ability enabling technology depends on the API's tools. So we listed at least 10 um, enabling technologies uh, earlier, and um, there are detailed guides in literature, some, some notes, you can find here some notes. For example, um, a very high dose compound usually disables solid dispersions because it's very standard to have something like 20 to 50% drug load in a solid dispersion. And if you imagine a one gram dose compound, then Having a 25% drug load means that your drug product intermediate is going to be four grams. And I don't think anyone uh, prefers taking a hamburger sized tablet. Then we have to carefully consider whether the API is dissolution or solubility limited. I mean, the absorption is dissolution or solubility limited. Sometimes these information are not available early on. Um, <clears throat> But this could also guide us um, towards advanced formulation methods as very really poorly soluble compounds uh, usually fail even with a micronized formulation. Then um, organic solvent solubility, thermal stability, solid state properties, and compatibility with excipients can also disable or enable certain, certain technologies out there. Um, five drugs are listed here. We talked about enzalutamide, which is available as an ASD in tablet form. It is also available in lipid solubilized systems. Darolutamide is micronized. Gefitinib is micronized. Procetinib is, again, a lipid solubilized formulation so in Gavrito. And Osaconazole is available as micronized material, as a solid dispersion, and also as a cyclodextrin complex. And for those who, who work in the formulation space, maybe an interesting fact that 
23% of bioequivalent studies fail with poorly soluble drugs, and the same is the same figure is 0.2% for soluble APIs. And this this support the, the difficulty, it supports the difficulty of, of formulating these, these ones. Sorry. The, the next group is the highly permeable, sorry, highly soluble but poorly permeable API group. This is this, yes, three. Usually conventional tablets and capsules are used. Sometimes lipid or emulsion-based formulations are applied on these APIs. In unique cases like the Merck compound or semaglutide, permeation enhancers are included. Um, several BCS3 compounds perform fairly well in conventional formulations and there's no need to do anything anything special, I mean, uh, about the final dosage form. And uh, we usually throw in the term permeation enhancer quite often, but in real life settings in humans, most of the classical excipients cannot really impact permeability, despite some in vitro or ex vivo data in, uh, shown in literature. Uh, true permeation enhancers include snack, which is used in semaglutide tablets, or the sodium capillary that we talked about, which is used in the Merck research compound for well, this compound. And uh, these are the true permeation enhancers, but other than hypothesis, we don't really know how they work. And the last group is the nightmare of formulators, BCS for the low solubility and low permeability compounds. If we have a true BCS for API in our hands, then um, developing an oral formulation is highly unlikely. Sometimes if it's a borderline BCS for some BCS2 approaches can help. Um, first, we have to identify what is the reason of, of the low permeability Maybe the compound precipitated in KCO2 assays, the solubility is so low that it precipitated in permeability measurements and a false negative or, or very low permeability was measured. Um, I put two question marks to venetoclax and abiraterone acetate. In literature, these are usually cited as poorly permeable APIs, so BCS4 compounds, but in reality, these might be BCS2 compounds acting like BCS4 compounds. Um, on the lower right-hand side, we have two APIs, Amphotericin B and, and Paclitaxel, which are prototypical BCS4 compounds with extremely low solubility and extremely low permeability. And an oral formulation is elusive, still elusive for both compounds. Amphotericin B is formulated as a liposome for injection, and some paclitaxel formulations are available out there. Um, abrexane, in abrexane, paclitaxel is bound to uh, nanoparticle at albumin. And uh, again, to support how difficult it is to, to formulate these compounds, um, between 2000 and 2011, exactly 0% of the generic approvals by the FDA belong to BCS4. OK, to, to sum up, BCS compounds are the easy one. The good ones, conventional tablets and your capsules are usually sufficient. BCS2, the bad ones, micronization is the default, default step. These are the poorly soluble compounds. But there are several enabling technologies out there. Usually amorphous solid dispersions or nanoparticles can solve the PK issues. The ugly ones are the poorly permeable ones. Um, in unique cases, permeation enhancers are included in the formulations. And the nightmare is the BCS4 group. Um, if we have a true BCS4 compound, then um, I think the best thing to do if we really want an oral formulation is to hand the material back to the medicinal chemist colleagues. Um, 
we had a technology called uh, SAS in the Drugability Enabling Technology Overview. SAS is an abbreviation of Controlled Expansion of Supercritical Solutions, and this is the core technology of Nanoform. Um, well, the upper left hand side shows the scheme of the SAS process. We load the API into a vessel, pressure vessel number two. We introduce CO2 into that vessel and increase the pressure and temperature. The CO2 gets into supercritical state, it will dissolve the API, and we take away the uh, CO2 based solution, SCCO2 based solution. And in the piping number three and four, the pressure and temperature are gradually decreased. The API will get into supersaturation and it will nucleate. And we collect the material in the collection vessel label number five um, after releasing it through a nozzle to atmospheric pressure. You can imagine it as snow falling here, really like white snow flakes coming out, but those are dry ice. Uh, that's dry ice snow in which we have the nanoparticles embedded, and then the dry ice sublimates and the neat nanoform the API is what remains. Some examples are shown on the right hand side for budesonide, azotimide, and piroxicam. Uh, we'll get back to this a bit later. And this is a new technology. So we developed an AI engine called StarMap to calculate certain properties of the API to determine the suitability um, of the SAS process to nanoform that API. Some compounds that are suitable for the technology are listed below. And um, the solubility of an API in SCCO2 in general is inversely proportional to water solubility. So mainly this is a tool to nanoform BCS class two and class four compounds. So uh, that is you very nicely introduced the square cube law. And on the right hand side, we have budesonide with extremely low particle size in the sub 100 nanometer range. We have azotimide in the middle image with particle size in uh, or about 100 nanometer or slightly above and peroxicam with about 400 nanometer particle size. And uh, we measured the specific surface area of these nanoformed APIs and it fits very well um, to the theoretical surface area of spheres of the respective size. So um, the smaller we go with particle size, um, we have this negative exponential uh, uplift in surface area that will lead to faster dissolution and in certain cases, higher apparent solubility as well to enable a higher extent of absorption from the GI tract. So the SAS technology is probably the only solution the particle technology that can manufacture nanoparticles without any excipients and organic solvents. Um, as we talked about on the previous slide, SAS does have some limitations. For example, salts and water soluble compounds in general are not suitable or not soluble in SCCO2. So we developed a second technology called the BioLine to nanoform water soluble compounds or larger peptides and macromolecules. And uh, this uh, BioLine is suitable to, to nanoform BCS class one and class three, mainly class three compounds uh, if necessary. For example, that Merck compound could be a prime example that could benefit from nanoform. So uh, we take the API solution and we nebulize that and a cold drying gas dries these droplets, then we separate the particles and collect the, the particles, and we end up with the nanoform material. Um, <laughs> our first case study is a nanocrystalline formulation. It, we have APIX here, an unnamed API. And APIX is a prototypical so poorly soluble drug. An amorphous solid dispersion is marketed, and the solid dispersion is, is a decent one. It exhibits a good PK profile. However, it 
represents a um, large daily PL burden. Starmap reported a good fit for, for this API and it was successful in Anaform with the SAS technology. And we tested it in vivo. The non-crystalline formulations matched the performance of the market with amorphous solid dispersion. And ultimately, a tablet was developed based on the nanocrystals, reducing the PL burden to a single PL a day, as you can see here. So in this case, the nanoformed crystalline API matched the performance of an ASD, and it enabled higher drug load in the final dosage form and a lower PL burden. There are certain compounds out there that no matter what we do cannot be delivered in the idea or route. And in those cases, a subcutaneous or, or intramuscular injection might be the, the choice of delivery route. Um, the nanoformed APIs are present as pure API powders. So those can be easily used to develop a long-acting injectable formulation. In the middle image, you can see one such formulation that we developed. You can see uh, this is the formulated um, um, suspension SCM image. You can see the particle size is about 500 nanometers. And this uh, formulation could enable higher drug loading enabling lower injection volumes. Um, it is known that in the subcutaneous injections, a particle size reduction usually means an uplift in bioavailability that will again lead to lower dose and slash or lower volumes. A smaller needle gauge might be enabled to, um, to have a less painful injection. And it is known from literature that nanoparticles um, yield less injection site immune reactions. So overall, a long-acting injectable nanoparticle formulation could offer better therapeutic efficacy and better patient compliance. Um, to summarize, there are several formulation options and technologies out there. And usually the physical chemical properties uh, of the molecule will help you guide which um, formulation strategy, strategy to choose. And it is possible to be smart around development approach using AI tools. Uh, we talked briefly about star map, which can uh, predict or calculate the solubility of certain com of, of the compounds in SCCO2. And uh, please feel free to contact us if you wish to discuss the possibilities to maximize the value of your products in development. And um, here you can find some very nice um, review papers um, about general formulation selection for mathematics and modeling geeks. There are some absorption modeling out there. And the last paper is a review about long-acting injectables. All right, well, thank you so much, Tomas, for that uh, very nice overview. Um, learned a lot in a very short amount of time. Actually, there was a lot of surprising stuff in there I, I didn't realize going into this. Um, I mean, it sounds like there are so many ways that you can have best-in-class products that, you know, I think chemists often don't think of. I mean, the fact that you can get rid of the food effect uh, you mentioned that example where you were like by going to nanoparticles, you can get rid of the dependency on uh, fed state. I know that was a big issue for GLP uh, molecules. So that's that's quite interesting. I uh, didn't realize like cyclodextrin complex complexation was already commercial in a number of products. Um, and the the long acting injectable thing that you had here, I thought that was interesting. Just the, the notion that you can reduce the size of the needle um, that you need for the injection. You know that's that's not something we typically think of in chemistry like uh but of course that that makes total sense um and one final thing that you pointed out that again i didn't realize was uh often in chemistry when we think of like the upper limit of pill size we think of you a gram right but as you mentioned if you need half a gram of excipients or you know 800 gram milligrams of excipients 
you know, actually a real limit of API might be, you know, a hundred or 200 megs, which is very interesting to think about. So thank you. Um, so with that, we can go to questions. Uh, I see there are a couple in here already. So I'll just uh, pick out a couple here. Uh, one from Josh Hansen is, can improvements in exposure using formulations like SNAC or CAP be predicted using in vivo uh, rodent PK? That's a tough nut to crack to, to predict um, a permeation enhancers um, efficacy, let's say, based on rodent PK or in rodent models. Yeah, I, I do recall from the Merck presentation on there specifically, I think they used non-human primates extensively to to model the effect of the formulation. Um, do you guys, uh, you mentioned uh, with your other case studies with some of these nanoformed products, uh, you were using rodent models, right, to, to look at the exposures? Yes, uh, but those are uh, simpler, small molecules. For those snack based formulations, uh, we have to consider that the rodents are continuously at least between fasted and fat states. Mm -hmm. They are eating continuously, so they secrete bile salts uh, continuously. So it won't really mimic what, what happens in humans, where we have a clear fasted state with very low bile salt secretion and the fat state with a lot of lipids and a lot of bile salts. So rodents are at least in between, even in the fasted state. Interesting. Oh, I didn't realize that about rodents. Actually, that's fascinating. So no wonder people people like non-human primates. Huh. Um, OK, another one here is from Stuart Levy. He says, uh, 17 years on from 2006, the proportions of BCS class 1, 2, 3, and 4 molecules have shifted significantly to class two, three, and four, um, which drives the need for growth and advancement in R&D and reduc uh, reduction of uh, scalable enabling approaches. Um, can you comment on the implications of this shift going to more BCS class two, three, and four now that it's 2024? I, I guess that's why we're we're here doing what we're doing um, is because uh, of, of the complexity in in formulations and um, that was one of the reasons that Nanoform was was created as a business was to try to solve some of these challenging molecules um, and obviously a huge amount of investment has gone into the into Nanoform as a company and and there are other companies trying to solve some of these 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 challenges so you know if you think back maybe 10 15 years ago spray drying um, was probably seen as quite a novel thing to do. Whereas now it's almost a go-to, you know, uh, technology to be used to solve some of these problems. Um, and it's the way that we've seen Anaform's technology being uh, being developed, you know, as it starts to get more traction and people start to see the value that it can create, um, we hope that it will become the next de facto technology to be used in the industry. Hmm. Very interesting. Actually, that's a good point. Um, you know, this this trend, I remember uh, it was big news a while ago when Pearl Therapeutics was acquired for like a billion dollars or something. And that was a formulation company. And so, uh, yeah, seeing innovation in the formulation space and seeing, you know, that interest now, I guess that it makes sense why all of a sudden now we're we're seeing more activity there. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of, I guess, uh, you know, changing molecules, somebody asks, are there any specific formulations that are recommended for molecules such as Protax? And these tend to be, you know, very high molecular weight. And I'm sure you, I mean, you guys probably talk to these companies all day long. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Protax are one of the more challenging group of uh, uh, molecules uh, being developed today for, for bioavailability. They're notoriously difficult, um, and um, we've had some success with Protax, and we've had some molecules that haven't been as successful. Um, but every every molecule is different. But um, Tamash, any any comments? I think you summarize it very well. That those are notoriously difficult to formulate. Hmm. All right. So. Um, uh... Cheng Cheng Jin Dao uh, Gao asks, "What is the lowest amount of material that you need in order to start the nanocrystal and work, uh, and what is the recovery uh, like?" So, um, as we've developed our technology, um, 
we've actually, and using machine learning and AI, um, we've been able to identify the process parameters uh, more quickly that we need for a given molecule. Um, so actually we need to do less screening at the front end, which is really uh, beneficial when you've got very small quantities of material available. Um, so we could start a project if you if the, if the partner has between 500 milligrams to a gram. Um, and we could turn around um, results and hopefully material within uh, three to four weeks. Um, so that's a very a very fast, rapid screen, um, and hopefully we'd be able to provide enough material with maybe some small um, suspension development that you could then take that forward into an in vivo study um, to get some idea of the benefits. Obviously, that's not full formulation optimization by any means, um, but it might give you an indication if uh, the technology could be valuable for you. That makes sense. Yeah, that's certainly enough for a, a rodent study or something like that. So, uh, makes sense. Uh, one question from Yogesh uh, uh, Jagtap is, what are the difficulties in scale up of these nanopar nanoparticle based formulations? Great question. Um, so, um, I would say there's scale up of technology and there's scale up of formulation. And um, at Nanoform, uh, when we started out um, only probably, you know, five years ago, really pushing the technology into the industry, we we're sort of in the, the milligrams an hour range. We're now in the kilograms an hour range, and we're actually at ton scale for certain APIs uh, per year in terms of throughput. Um, so that's the, that's the I guess, the scale aspect of the technology development itself. But then you've got the scale of the formulation as well. Um, and typically the way that these particles behave is that they like to um, uh, self-aggregate um, uh, sort of we, we, we term them loose aggregates so they sort of cluster together as like micron sized particles which are actually relatively easy to handle compared to for, for example micronized material which has got a top-down approach and you put lots of energy in, and then these particles become quite highly charged and become quite electrostatic so scalability around formulation is relatively simple and um and we've certainly developed um, lots of formulations in that space. Um, what we didn't talk about, I guess we touched upon today, was the Peroxicam clinical study. And I, I guess it touches on another of the questions that was in the uh, in the chat. Um, so we actually were able, we, def, we didn't put this into humans, but we're actually able to make a 100% drug load tablet. So because of the nanoparticles and because of their surface area, they were able to compress really nicely into a tablet, but they also disintegrated uh, very well and, and had good um, uh, uh, dissolution properties. Um, but that gives you the opportunity, the idea about how you can increase drug load in a tablet formulation. But in that study, um, we actually went head to head with the Pfizer Brexidol uh, uh, product, the blockbuster from the 80s. And we went um, up against the Brexidol product from Chiesi. And if you remember Tamash's slides, Brexidol um, was also a beta cyclodextrin based uh, product. And we pretty much got the same performance, a slightly faster onset um, of absorption as the Brexidol product, but without the need for cyclodextrin. And again, that's another sort of, I guess, um, angle to consider is if you can have a really simple formulation just by controlling the size of the ingredients, that's clearly a, a, a smarter solution. It gives you more um, ability to control the drug size, the drug product um, tablet size. Um, and, and then the other angle around, um, I guess, perhaps it's not so much related to scale, but more about environmental sustainability. And this is a big driver that we're seeing from a, particularly a lot of our major pharma partners um, is about being smart about the processing technologies of which they use for drug formulation. So amorphous solid dispersions, typically in spray drying, can often use tens of thousands of litres of organic hydrocarbon solvent um, to produce you know, a kilo of material and of API, whereas our technology uses a recycled um, a carbon dioxide that's captured from, from, from a, a waste product from, the, from, uh, from Finland, and it's made into um, GMP quality uh, CO2, and then that's used as the solvent. And now we're investing into recycling that CO2 even further. So actually using our technology means that if a partner works with us, they'd have Nanoform as a carbon sink. So this is a really 
whilst it's probably not something that a medicinal chemist would think about um, in their day-to-day -day, uh, work, um, it's it's really important that we think about how we can be environmentally sustainable um, by doing what we're doing as well. Very cool. All right, well, thank you, Christian. Uh, I know there's still a lot of questions in the chat, but because we're at time, I think we'll wrap it up here.